Thanks for joining this very important series entitled, The Church Equals the Temple of God. The Church Equals the Temple of God. And I'm going to start off with somewhat of a shocking statement, but if you are a part of the church and thus the temple of God, you are dwelling in the new heaven and new earth. I know, again, it's very shocking. If you were like me and raised up in a uh, futurist environment, an environment, basically a religious environment that places all eschatology off into the future and all of these beautiful, wonderful promises of God in the Old Testament prophecies, uh, prophets concerning the kingdom of God, and and you place those off into the future, then you know what I'm talking about. That is exactly what I was raised in. I was raised in what's called dispensationalism. And dispensationalism is essentially taught that there was going to be a rebuilt temple in our future. So really the way it worked out ultimately was you had an old covenant temple and then you had a new covenant temple, the church, and then you had this future Almost an old covenant temple, the way I was raised in classic dispensationalism, where sacrifices would be reinstituted. And it was just, um, honestly, it was a very dangerous system because it essentially staves off the reign and kingdom of Christ and uh, forces God's hand to opt for plan B. All right, because the Jews rejected his initial plan of salvation, God had to figure out something else. And that is what they would oftentimes refer to as an interim period or the church age. But unfortunately, their church age was a temporal age. And uh, yeah, I bought into it for years and even taught it. But thankfully, the Lord began to cause me to study the scriptures, actually study the Old Testament. One of the things I found is that people's... uh, eschatology is driven by a lack of knowledge of Old Testament prophecies. And I think it's just so clear, and I think that we will see that throughout this series. It's a long series, and so I'm going to break it up into probably 10 to 15-minute segments. Uh, This first one hopefully will uh, be a little bit of a bait for you to continue on. Uh, I'm going to give away a lot of the secrets in this first episode. And uh, that I that I hope will stir your mind and your heart to continue throughout the series. And uh, we hope that you would subscribe to the channel in CMI Live at YouTube. Uh, also, feel free to visit us at newcreationministries.tv. Well, let's begin this uh, wonderful series. It really is going to be wonderful. I, I believe that you are going to be thoroughly edified as we study the church as the temple of God. And there is the statement. If we are the church, then we are in the new heaven and new earth. So let's begin this study. And I, again, hope that you are edified and blessed and uh, brought to a place of sheer gratitude for what the Lord has accomplished. And if you notice, the verse that is going to be uh, in that lower right-hand corner throughout the study is 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. This is very, very important. It's a hermeneutic. It's a principle of hermeneutics that we must adopt when we are studying the scripture. Okay? You are the temple of the living God, as God has said. So he's saying this is a reality just like God said, just like it was prophesied. And here's the prophecy. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So Paul is saying this is fulfilled. Very important. And the other thing that we're going to see in this study is that there is no such thing as two fulfillments of it. There's no such thing as two kingdoms. It's one kingdom that was prophesied. And one of the reasons that these self-proclaimed Jews despise Christianity is because so much of Christianity, the vast majority of Christianity, teaches that Messiah came but split it up to where the kingdom, half of it is is, is shoved off into the future. And uh, they rightly attack that Christian view, that erroneous Christian view of eschatology. Because there's nothing in the Old Testament scripture which teaches that the kingdom would be broken up. The Bible teaches that when Messiah would come, when the Lord would dwell among his people, when he would be their God and they would be his people, it was one kingdom. 
And they were anticipating that. But Christians do despot to the scriptures, the intent and spirit of the scriptures, when they break it off uh, in such a horrendous uh, display of unfulfillment. It's an attack against God's kingdom, and it's an attack against the reigning king of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ. But let God be true, but every man a liar. So let's see what the scripture has to say. All right. The first scripture we're going to examine is Jeremiah chapter 31. Now, almost every Christian will admit that this particular passage is shown to be fulfilled in Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 10 as referring to the new covenant. So this is Jeremiah chapter 31. We're going to going to read verses 31 through 33. Behold, the day is come, says the Lord, that I will cut or make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I cut with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And that was the beginning of the old covenant, which covenant of mine they broke, although I was a husband to them. Interesting terminology there, right? I was a husband to them. Says the Lord, But this shall be the covenant that I will cut or make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts. And notice, compare this with the the verse over to the right there. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So this was a future unfulfilled prophecy at the time of the writing of Jeremiah. But Paul is saying that now it is fulfilled. God is dwelling among. The te- this is the, the temple here, right? You are the temple. So he's speaking about the temple here in Jeremiah chapter 31. I will put my law in their inward parts. I will write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And you can compare that with Romans chapter eight, verses one through four, which we will not really get into in this particular series. But he's clearly contrasting two covenants, which is what Hebrews The whole book of Hebrews is about, but it's also certainly what Hebrews chapter 8, which quotes this passage, and Hebrews chapter 10 uh, are both doing. They are contrasting the covenants. Okay, so he speaks about the old covenant in verse 32, and then the new covenant in verse 33. So the fulfillment of this is that God would be their God and they would be his people. Well, Ezekiel 36 speaks of the same covenant, verses 23 through 28. And by the way, I'm going to examine two passages, Ezekiel 36, verses 23 through 28, and Ezekiel 37, verses 23 through 28. So it's a good way to remember that they're speaking about the same thing, just one chapter apart. So he says, I will sanctify my great name. This is looking forward to the fulfillment of this messianic prophecy. I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst which we see this, uh, Paul speaking about the Pharisaic Jews uh, causing the Gentiles to blaspheme God's name. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord. So this is obviously the new covenant where Jesus says, the hour is coming and now is when those who worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth. And this would, of course, involve the nations, all right, to the Jew first and then to the Greeks. So that was something they all were expecting. The nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. Now, did they know that the Gentiles would be saved? No, they probably interpreted this as what happened with Egypt. Egypt will know that I am the Lord. And we see that that had catastrophic implications. But this is different. Okay, this is the mystery that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs of the same promise and partakers of that promise in Christ by the gospel. He says, When I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes, for I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all lands, I will gather you into your own land. So this is this gathering of which we are speaking. Of course, Caiaphas the high priest in John chapter 11 says that this is what the death of Christ would do, that it would be a gathering. Remember, uh, as we saw in the previous series, which uh, please examine the series that I just did before this called You Are Already Glorified. And uh, what I do in there and, and another video is I show that God is the inheritance. God says, I am your lot and your inheritance. In other words, God is the land. Okay. We would dwell in Christ. That's what it means to dwell in Christ. And that was prophesied in numbers. 
I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all lands, and will gather you into your own land. That's Christ. And I will sprinkle clean waters on you, and you shall be clean. This is speaking of none other than Christ and his precious blood. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness. That's what the death of Christ does. It cleanses us from sin and from your idols. And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Again, this is the new covenant. This is the new covenant concept and promise and fulfillment of regeneration. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And we see that that took place at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and was prophesied by Christ. He that believes on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And it says, this spoke he of the Holy Spirit, which was not yet given for he had not yet been glorified. So this is a fulfillment of that. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. That's Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we are always walking in his statutes. Why? Because Christ fulfilled that for us. doesn't mean we do it in thought or practice. It means that God sees us as such. Okay? It's so beautiful. And you shall keep my judgments, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. There it is. Look over to the right. Paul says it's fulfilled. You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. We are gathered into Christ. That is the land promise. I will be their God. They shall be my people. He says it's just as it is written. Well, then again, one chapter over, uh, same, uh, same verse references actually, but one chapter later. Verses 23 through 28 of Ezekiel 37. Nor shall they be defiled with their idols, even their filthy idols, nor with all of their transgressions, but I will save them out of all their dwelling places. This is the salvation of Christ. He shall save them from their sins. I will save them out of all their dwelling places in them where they sinned and will cleanse them. Again, no cleansing takes place except by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And look, and they shall be to me for a people and I will be to them for God. There it is. Again, over to the right. Second Corinthians. Paul sets the hermeneutic. That's what Jesus does too, that it might be fulfilled, which was written in the prophet Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. That's how they uh, regarded these kings oftentimes. Uh, I've mentioned this before. If you were a musician at the time of Johann Sebastian Bach, oftentimes they'd refer to you as a Bach right? Well, this is just speaking of Jesus Christ. Psalm 18, that God said that Judah would never lack a man to be on the throne. And and so this is speaking of Jesus. David, my servant, it's just a family name, okay? Shall be king over them. There should be one shepherd to all of them. What did Jesus say? I am the good shepherd. There shall be one shepherd to all of them. They shall walk in my judgments and obey my laws and do them. And they shall dwell in the land. Same context of Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. They shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, the land in which your fathers have lived. And they shall dwell in it, even they and their sons and the sons of their sons forever. And my servant David shall be their ruler forever. Okay, Bethlehem, out of you shall come him that is to be ruler of Israel, whose goings are from everlasting to everlasting. This is Jesus. And I will cut a covenant of peace. Clearly, Jesus Christ's covenant of peace. This is the new covenant in my blood. Hebrews chapter 13 calls it a new or an everlasting covenant. Okay. I will cut a covenant with peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them. I will set my sanctuary in their midst. Again, look over to the right. You are the temple or the sanctuary of the living God. As God has said, what? I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. What does he say in uh, Ezekiel 37? I will place them, multiply them, will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My tabernacle shall be with them. This is the temple. And yes, I will be their God and they shall be my people. Amen. Hallelujah. And the nations shall know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my temple is in their midst forever. 
So very beautiful. So we will continue this in part two, and I hope that you were stirred. I hope that shows you that we are the temple of the living God. Uh, We're going to look at the accompanying elements of each of these passages, and we are going to compare them, of course, with Revelation 21, where God says in this new heaven and new earth, I will be their God. They shall be my people.